in each chapter you're drawing on specific animals and the ways in which like there's and this is so obvious now to me at least but it still surprises me how how fundamentally the same uh animal cultures are to human culture um animal societies are but it, it still yeah it still surprises me in ways that it, these things uh, um, we tend to create these divisions or separations and and animal cognition and human cognition um, which aren't really seemingly there I mean there's there's novelty or differences in between these species of course but none nonetheless um, the way that you both write about these animals and how you know the, the using the structure of the the this concept of the evolved nest to um, show just how animals really care for their their, for each other and for their young um yeah it, it it's uplifting but it's also it's it there's something uh, incredibly sad and tragic about it because the sort of brokenness of the evolved nest in so many uh human communities or or just in human um in our, in our lives it just sort of expands and spreads outward into these animal communities as well describing complex uh, ptsd in these um elephants um that part of the book in particular i had to kind of stop <laughs> And really, um, uh, it, it, I don't know, it hit me, it hit me in, a, in, a, in a place where I had to kind of sit with that for a moment and just think about um, those parallels and how we're really not different at all. Um, well, there, you know, I would say um, a couple of things on that is that well, one is the, the, the quote unquote real difference, I think, between species, between humans and non-humans is not the uh, is really not our minds, but how we use them. Um, you know, orcas and, and elephants and octopuses don't have never committed genocide, and um, mm -hmm. and you know all of the things mm -hmm. that we're dealing with right now and all the trauma. And on the elephant, I think that that chapter in particular, when you talk about um, or asking about Darsha and our collaboration, I would say that right there. Um, is a very pivotal chapter, and Darsha, maybe you can talk about that because uh, you know, what I described in in the elephants and communities, which is the same thing that's happening with deer, which is the same thing that's happening with bears, which is the same thing that's happening. I don't know if you heard about the orcas in you know outside Spain that are you know knocking boats and yeah. doing. Things. They're actually even um, dolphins are killing um, uh, porpoises and seals. So all of these symptoms of trauma, uh, which you talk about. But Darsha, maybe you can talk about it because what is what happened with the elephants is the breakdown of their society, the traditional societies, the and the trauma. So it's not just what happened to them, but what then happens afterward, like this cascade. They don't have the developmental, uh, the normative de developmental pathways that they evolved with, and that's the core of the evolved nest. So the elephants are really. A, um, sort of a stellar, unfortunately, a stellar example of what happens when you don't follow the evolved nest. And Darsha has written extensively about that, which you have probably heard in these earlier interviews, um, what happens in human society. Darsha, I think that would be something for you to talk about. Sure. Yeah. So the evolved nest is about the features of the environment, the uh, community, the family and community that foster optimal, normal functioning. And we have in the human uh, dominant culture eroded the, these characteristics of the evolved nest over thousands of years. And just really, uh, so that's not, not even talking about abuse, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a form of neglect to not um, be provided uh, touch and being carried all the time as a baby and, and such. Uh, so besides uh, missing the nest, then we also abuse children beyond that. And that's where um, we got complex, all sorts of complex trauma building up over, over the years. So the big thing about the missing nest is you are now establishing distrust and disconnection in that child, in that whether animal or human. Uh, and that just undermines development over the lifespan because we are here as earth members of the earth community as you know uh in the loving arms or a nestingness of mother earth 
and you now break it by distressing a baby, by leaving them alone to cry, by punishing them, uh, spanking babies. Half of adults in the States say that they spank their one-year-olds. Uh, so th this is just insanity from the perspective of, of raising a, a well-functioning child of any any species. Yeah, so you know, throughout the book, you describe the, uh, basically what is required for human beings to have a intact evolved nest in order to develop, uh, you know, basically fully realized human beings. Um, and you, of course, you draw on examples from other, uh, animals. Um, you know, like, uh, the one about, uh, play and how important that is in the development of not just children, but also of adults. And I was just thinking about this, you, you were using um, beavers and beaver societies and beaver communities as ways of exemplifying this, because I think in the, the, the kind of imaginary, we tend to think of beavers as like hardworking, like they are dedicated to their craft of building dams and these lodges, right? And we have this idea of them being just almost like compelled to constantly make and create and maintain these structures, like the kind of like Protestant work ethic of animals or something. Right. <laughs> but in reality, in their like in their nests and their communities, they build, they're creating a safe environment uh, for these beaver families and these groups to really play and to be able to develop this trust to be able to do that. Um, and of course this has like widespread ecological, uh, ripple effects, it, it seems to also really just benefit every other living being near uh, near these um, beaver dams and beaver lodges. So the, the point, I guess, is just to get at, you know, how, why you chose each of these animals to discuss what is maybe missing right now in the human evolved nest, like why we don't have play, why that, why it's overly structured around the adults' work schedule, or something, or schools, or um, you know how ethics are developed, or um, the role that aloe carers or aloe mothers play in this. You know, just I'm curious how you both, like, what your criteria was for both of you to choose the animals you did to describe and discuss the things that you wanted to discuss in the book. Um, I'm not sure who I would ask to first answer that, but um, Darsha, you seem like you want to go for it. Well, I think Gay uh, took the lead on this. I um, oh, okay. primarily uh, my I have favorite animals, bears and wolves, but uh, mm. she also uh, really has insight into which animals demonstrate uh, and and expand the imagination of the reader to realize that all animals have nests, right? So you don't want to just stick to mammals, for example. So Gay, you want to. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was organic. Um, you know, both Darsh and I love bears. I've written a book about, well, actually, Charlie Russell with um, bears called Talking Talking with Bears and Charlie Russell. And I recommend that because it really gives you an insight. It, it, it's a version of, it's an adult, it, it is a kind of an evolved nest book <laughs> because mm. it talks about how a, a human man um, learned how to uh, raise three orphan baby brown bears in Kamchatka, Russia. And he was mentored by a female brown bear. These were wild bears. So it is a kind of a version of the evolved nest of, of a human learning that um, and um, across species. But I think it was really organic. And as Darsha said, I think partly um, on my part, um, we I, I think there was a kind of an element uh, in the sense of a beaver. You know, I think we, we even talk about that in the beginning. You know, everyone's image is this uh, workaholic, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and And so in a sense... I think that for each chapter, I'd have to think about it, is kind of um, surprising in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, like the octopus is emotions. Well, is an mm -hmm. octopus emotional? Well, there's a huge, even among the quote unquote experts of the octopus, um, they're still arguing whether or not an octopus feels pain, despite this whole, you know, even a mm -hmm. neuroscientist, a group of neuroscientists in Cambridge in 2012 made this Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness saying, octopuses, invertebrates, including have the same thing that mammals do in terms of the neural substrates to feel, con you know, have to have consciousness and pain and all of those things. So I think we chose um, kind of organically, um, think like a bear, you know, the, the, the bear one, of course, that's a favorite for Darsha and I, as I said, but it was in the sense of um, no one really thinks about that really was spurred by, for example, this, um, that bears don't automatically and humans don't, Darsha can talk about that. Don't add them automatically when they're impregnated. Don't, the egg doesn't 
um, begin to grow. And so it's sort of like this pause. And so that was that was it too, like Darsha said, in terms of the imagination to go go inward, you know, to try to kind of see the experience of these individuals and these different communities um, in a different way. And, um, you know, the, the wolves, moral commitment, um, you know, they're they're painted as these vicious, terrible things. They're shot from helicopters. They're still massacred. Um, mm. And of course, they're showing trauma that we talk about. But who thinks about a, a, a wolf ha having morals or the wolf community having morals? So in that way, it was really, I think both Darsha and I had fun because it was just, in, in speaking of play, it was playful at, at mm. one level in terms of like, wow, you know, there's all this commonality what what can we see you know what is really kind of emerging when we look through this you know lens of the evolved nest hmm. well there was something that you know in the, in the writing uh about these animals you know you you use um you write about them in a way that a person would write about human relationships so there's times where you say you know they'll fall in love with each other and they decide to like start a family and they have partnerships and there's like, um, you aren't seemingly worried or concerned with, afraid of at all, the idea of anthropomorphizing these creatures. And I'm curious how you come to that place where, um, you know, there's an, you're talking about ethics, you're talking about morality, you're talking about things that human beings seemingly are, are concerned about. Like, how do we instill ethics and character and morality in our children and all of this stuff. And then you're talking about, you know, beavers doing this and you're talking about wolves doing this and bears. And I, I guess I'm curious and, and uh, just as someone who's listening, who may be like, well, how could I even think about it in that way when I'm thinking about beavers or <laughs> thinking about these animals? How did you both, I mean, Gay, maybe I'll throw it to you first, just because of your experience directly with these animals, you know, how did you come to this place where you're, I mean, maybe you never had this to begin with, but how do people kind of get over this sort of concern about like treating animals in a way that we would treat other human beings in, in this regard? Do you know what I'm maybe kind of getting at here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, for one thing, I, I grew up that way, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, um, I didn't grow up. I grew up what I would call in sort of a non-dual world um, in, in that sense. Uh, but I have been taken in my own work with the the analyses and the books that I've written and stuff, um, the neurosciences, because that's accepted. And I didn't make it up. It's all throughout the neurosciences. The data is there. The theory is data of this unitary model of brain, mind, and consciousness. So it's already tacit mm -hmm. and open in science, Western science. So that was where I, that's where I build my inference. And so and I'm not the only one, like I talk about the Cambridge Declaration, that, that it's very open, but people don't go down there, even scientists. So the inference is very powerful just within this very limited framework of Western science. Um, and that's not even taking into account um, views of, of traditional indigenous cultures, which I, I haven't done that so much because I'm, I'm less familiar. I don't come from that kind of background. I stayed mm -hmm. within the confines. So the question is, is why are we using this um, biased and um, inaccurate um, inference? And uh, why are we using that as a baseline? You know, why why can't we talk about penguins falling in love? Um, mm -hmm. Why can't why not? Mm -hmm. um, and and so really, you know, the the onus comes on the people like me and Darsha, you know, but that's where the, the science even says that. So that the inference. And so this is also very much a part of Darsha's work is talking about how over thousands of years, the dominant human society has been conditioned and conditioned the globe, human population, through genocide, through oppression, through slavery, da, 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 da. Um, this false view of reality. Mm. And, and that's now, that's taken as the baseline. And so it's totally, there's no, there's no foundation. There's no foundation from a, from a sensibility perspective, and there's no foundation from a scientific perspective. And so, you know, the evolved nest, which I think is really powerful. I, I'm not sure that we appreciate, at least I don't think I appreciated how 
powerful um, bringing us together in terms of showing the commonalities across species um, is for helping humanity um, unpeel and, and shed this terrible um, um, brainwashing that mm -hmm. has had such pernicious effects on every aspect of our life. And of course the planet. And, and I was going to make a comment, you know, our language, we should, there should not be commonalities. I struggle with that. We use nature. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in my own work, I'm starting to say non-human human. human. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and ecological and social are one and the same. So mm -hmm. when you're looking at a beaver, when you're looking at a wolf, when you're looking at an elephant uh, or a brown bear, uh, an octopus. There's no difference in their life between ecological and social. It's all one. Mm. So we're really moving, and this is part of a broader movement um, to a conscious, a non-dual consciousness, um, and 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 a, and a sense of appreciating diversity as opposed to difference, in which dualism and this whole nightmare <laughs> is, is rooted. But but that's also the essence of the of the evolved nest, like your question about how do ethics, I mean, in a sense, it's like, you know, that's what Darsh has been pointing out with her work. I mean, it's almost a ridiculous question. Hmm. Because if you look at our ancestral before all of this stuff happened. Hmm. Um, things look pretty good on the planet. As far as we can tell, there was lots of animals, there was lots of freshness, there wasn't massive human violence and things like that. I just wanted to underscore the fact that the view that humans are unique in their intellect and reasoning mm. and imagination and all that. Uh, it's just a recent view. It's only a few hundred years old. It's got roots mm. in ancient Greek, Greece. Um, but that's, you know, less than 1% of our existence as a species. And our, by and large, and that's just a small minuscule part of that 1%, uh, by and large, our species has always treated other animals with respect because they had a set they had their full brains <laughs> well developed mm -hmm. they were nurtured well and they felt uh communion with the others the mm -hmm. the other persons on the planet the the planet is full of of persons only some of whom are human right so mm -hmm. uh that basic understanding all our ancestors uh, ancestors had it um and it's just our recent, you know, moving into the intellect, the left brain, co ego consciousness, however you want to call it, uh, divorcing humanity from nature, from others, doing it, going into dualism, you know, either, mm -hmm. either or thinking instead of both and. That's all recent stuff. It has roots in ancient Greece. But um, <clears throat> we understand now that that's just a false narrative, as Gay was saying. Uh, and what how we develop is neurobiologically, we are built from the ground up, co-constructed by our experiences, especially humans, because we have 30 years of, of development before we reach adult maturity, uh, and especially malleable because we're born 18 months early compared to other animals, primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have so much that gets developed by experience with others. And um somehow the you know when you're stuck in your little ivory tower mind your ego consciousness you forget body you forget relationships you forget connectedness and you mm -hmm. think just your little intellectual models is all you need and you can apply them in the world and then uh, you don't see that they don't really work because you don't perceive your social emotional intelligence is not in the ivory tower mind uh, mm -hmm. and we've undermined our social emotional intelligence of, for decades now especially uh, in the United States. And so people just don't know what's real anymore. And so they're told stories and then they believe the story that latches onto their feelings of fear that were instituted by the early undercare. They were left alone and left to cry and broken their trust. And so then they link on, up to narratives that tell them they're, they're superior than these other people. Beware of those people. And they learn then to uh, be oriented to power dynamics, right? Domination, power over. And that's mm -hmm. where we are in the States. We're kind of wrecking the world, the United States, mm -hmm. with its power over orientation. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> yeah, we can get into, uh, I mean, it's amazing how I think you can um, examine down to, yeah, speaking of childbearing practices and just how that completely informs a culture and how it can manifest on this, even on the, this sort of macro level, of like political dynamics and um, 
it's it's Gabor, Gabor Mate who who wrote our foreword. I mean, his book was the myth of normal. You hmm. know, the problem is is that um, it becomes it perpetuates because it becomes. Yeah normative from a statistical not from a health perspective and i just wanted to interject one little anecdote um which i really think that that uh this view reifies and i read an article and there's this man and he i think it was back east and he's walking along in the winter along the river in the city and you know it was really really cold and the river was partly frozen and he looks out and he sees this dog drowning you know and the dog's frantic and so the guy rips off his jacket, jumps in, saves the dog in very dangerous circumstances. And then a reporter interviewed him, you know, while he's sitting there, you know, with the paramedics and said, well, you know, what made you do this? You know? And he said, I don't know. I don't even like dogs. And <laughs> I find that such a, a powerful mm -hmm. anecdote because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just what, what Darsh, I mean, in other words, his inner natural self that impulse was to save life. Mm -hmm. And I don't even like dogs. I mean, I don't know if that word came, but I mean, it was sort of like, that's not even important. The point is, is um, this positive, you know, pro-social life, life loves life. Mm -hmm. That's really, I think the message of, of the evolved nest. Mm -hmm.